Hi, this is Christine, and welcome to this short educational presentation on fluoroscopic imaging. Today we're going to review how to perform a double contrast barium enema to properly evaluate the large bowel. By the end of this video, you should be familiar with how to make the proper assessments of your patient. You should also be able to describe an overview of the steps of a double contrast barium enema. Lastly, you should be able to describe proper positioning for spot images of specific portions of the colon. In this examination, both barium sulfate and air are administered through the rectum. When the exam is limited to barium or water-soluble contrast only, the exam is called a single contrast study. This educational video focuses on the double contrast exam. Before performing any procedure, it is your responsibility to assess the indications for the study by reviewing the written or electronic order, which should provide sufficient information to demonstrate the medical necessity of the examination. Determine the question that is to be answered by the examination. You may need to call the ordering physician or healthcare provider familiar with the patient's clinical problem to obtain this information if necessary. Here's a list of common indications you're probably already familiar with. This exam has potential in helping to diagnose pretty much any disease that's intrinsically or extrinsically affecting the colon. Make sure to document any pertinent history or patient symptoms. Changes in bowel habits may include hematochesia, diarrhea, or constipation. You can come across other pertinent history, such as previous colon polyps or a family history of diseases involving the colon. The possible contraindications of the exam include, but are not limited to, unexplained pneumoperitoneum and toxic megacolon. The examination requires the patient to roll and to turn on the table in order to coat the bowel and cannot be completed with a combative or uncooperative patient. The patient should wait one week before undergoing a barium enema if they've had a large forceps biopsy, a snare polypectomy, a hot biopsy, or any biopsy involving active inflammatory bowel disease. A barium enema may be performed on the same day if the patient had a small forceps biopsy. It's good practice to review any pertinent previous radiologic studies, the patient's most recent H&P, lab results, and any endoscopic or abdominal pelvic surgical procedural notes. These steps are just as important as knowing the indications for the procedure as they'll help guide you in your diagnostic assessment. After you document pertinent history and symptoms involving the lower GI tract, ask the patient questions regarding their colon preparation. These questions may be streamlined if the department gave simple instructions and preparation directions and if the patient answered a questionnaire on arrival. The technologist can also ask colon prep questions and inform you of pertinent information. Questions should answer the dietary habits of the patient in the last one to three days, depending on your department's protocols, their hydration habits, and if laxative or cleansing enemas were used. These preparations are intended to rid the colon of fecal material and of excess fluid as much as possible. Risks are minimal in comparison to the diagnostic benefit of the exam and can further be minimized by proper precautions and adequate aftercare instructions. A patient may be at greater risk for rectal tear or hemorrhoidal bleeding if they have a history including, but not limited to, any of the following. For these patients, the use of a retention balloon is contraindicated. I like to give the patient an overview of the steps before the start of the exam so they can mentally and physically prepare for what is expected. After a tube is inserted into the rectum, barium and air will fill, coat, and distend the entire colon while the x-ray video camera is on. I let them know that they will probably feel like they are constipated or need to have a bowel movement. They should breathe normally, try to relax their abdomen, and to continue to hold the tip in place. It is also important not to push. 
In order to examine the entire colon, the patient will have to turn maybe halfway to the right, then maybe face down on the table and all the way to the left. I might say to go back on your back. And by doing this, the colon is coated properly and we can see the outline of the colon. I also let them know the table might tilt so it feels like they're standing or it might tilt a little bit the other way and that I'm going to be talking with them throughout the procedure to let them know what's happening and how I'd like them to position. I let them know that images are taken with my x-ray machine to look at the different segments of the colon coated with barium and filled with air. I also let them know that this will take about five minutes or so. After that, the x-ray tech will take several more images of the entire colon to piece it all together and make sure nothing is missed. I tell them this will take about 10 minutes or so for the x-ray pictures. I then give the patient time to ask questions before the exam begins. A preliminary scout radiograph can be helpful in cases post-GI surgery or with a clinical history suggesting obstruction, perforation, inflammatory bowel disease, fistula, or abscess. It can also be helpful if there are suspicions of an ineffective colon prep. In this scout, radiopaque surgical clips are seen, as well as residual contrast from a prior CT examination, which caused the exam to be delayed. The materials needed include a fluoroscope set to a kilovoltage of 90 kVp or higher, a high-density barium suspension, which usually comes in a prepackaged unit, the appropriate rectal tip. If a rectal tip with a retention cuff is used, it is connected to a balloon inflator. Test the retention cuff before placing the tip. Hemostats can aid in securing the retention cuff tubing as well as the barium tubing. A thin portion of lubricating jelly is used on the rectal tip prior to insertion. Washable and disposable pads can be used to aid in patient comfort during the examination. A compression paddle may also be used. The barium bag is secured in a raised position on an IV pole to allow the contrast to flow. The patient is usually in somewhat of a left lateral position after the rectal tip is placed. I like to take a quick look at the tip in position, especially if a retention cuff is used, in order to ensure it's in the proper position and the cuff isn't over or under inflated. Bring the image intensifier or flat panel detector close to your patient since this reduces the dose to the patient, to you, and to the technologist. The patient is traditionally placed in the prone position to administer the barium, although in some indications, the exam should begin in the left lateral position. I like to control the barium flow by unpinching the tube with my right hand. I can slow or stop the barium by pinching the tube. At the same time, I'm able to watch the monitor and control the image intensifier with my left hand. The tube is only opened partially because a rapid distension of the rectum will increase the patient's urge to defecate. My foot intermittently depresses the pedal to watch the flow of barium. In the filling phase, barium should be intermittently watched until it reaches the mid-transverse colon. In general, turning the patient to the left anterior oblique or left side down position moves barium into the proximal sigmoid colon, the descending colon, and the splenic flexure. The barium will pass from the descending colon into the splenic flexure and into the transverse colon with ease in most patients but you can place the patient in a slight Trendelenburg position if the barium isn't moving into this area. Once a full column of barium reaches the apex of the splenic flexure, turning the patient to the prone position will move the barium into the middle of the transverse colon. Use fluoroscopy intermittently and briefly during this filling phase, but carefully analyze the contour of the colon and look for any abnormalities or defects in the barium pool. If an abnormality is seen while barium is filling the colon, take a spot radiograph. Once barium reaches the middle of the transverse colon, the enema bag is gently lowered to the floor and the rectum is drained by gravity. Make sure you don't clear the entire rectosigmoid colon of barium because we need enough barium within the colon to coat the entire mucosa and also fill the ascending colon. The small amount is cleared from the rectum to make sure there aren't pools of barium that might obscure lesions. 
The bag is then clamped and I tell the patient I'll put some air in the colon to complete this portion of the exam. The air is pumped from either room air or some departments use carbon dioxide. Make sure that you do this slowly, otherwise the patient experiences severe discomfort and it might incite rectosigmoid spasm. I like to instill two to three puffs with intermittent fluoroscopic pulses, position the patient, then again instill two to three puffs and I keep doing so until the colon is properly coated and distended. During this point of the exam, you need to be flexible yet compulsive. Spot images are taken of the rectum, sigmoid colon, hepatic and splenic flexures, and cecum. But the order doesn't matter so much as long as each loop of colon has adequate barium coating and distension and is demonstrated with as little superimposition or overlap as possible. I try to make sure I take a couple good double contrast images of the sigmoid colon, usually with the patient supine or in a slight supine oblique, before the barium reaches the cecum. Since reflux through the ileocecal valve could cause superimposition of the distal ileum on your sigmoid spot images. Continue turning the patient and intermittently and slowly instilling air to make sure the colon is coated and is being distended. I'm scanning the entire colon intermittently at this point. If I see any suspicions or abnormalities, I may further investigate by turning the patient under fluoro and I may mag to obtain a good spot image, then unmag to continue the exam. With the patient in a supine position, I'll ask them to turn on their right side facing me to move the barium into the proximal hepatic flexure, then lie on their back so the barium flows into the ascending colon. The patient may be asked to again face down in a prone position, then turn back to a supine position to achieve adequate coating. Remember, barium is much heavier than air and will fill any dependent space. If the barium isn't moving into the ascending colon and cecum with the patient on their right side or the table tilted, it's probably because there's not a large enough volume of barium. Whenever placing the patient in a lateral position, check out the proximal rectum to possibly take a good air contrast image of a lateral rectum or open up overlapping loops of the sigmoid colon. The table can be tilted upright to clear the barium pool and allow the flexures and transverse colon to distend. I usually place my hand on the patient's shoulder and ask them to steady their feet while I slowly raise the table to take good air contrast spot images of the flexures and transverse colon. You can usually get a nice image of the hepatic flexure with their right side lifted up in a left posterior oblique position. While they're in this position, bring the image intensifier down to look at the ascending colon. You may get a nice double contrast image of the hepatic flexure and distal ascending colon. To see the splenic flexure, oblique your patient with their right side down and the left side up in a right posterior oblique position. I usually bring the image intensifier down again to take a look at the ascending, proximal, and middle sections of the descending and the sigmoid colon to assess anatomy and take spot images. Once you have good images of the patient in the upright position, bring the table back to horizontal and do a quick overall scan in unmag mode. You may get a good image of the proximal ascending colon or the inferior portion of the transverse colon. At this point, if contrast has refluxed into the appendix and terminal ilium, take an image. If there's too much contrast in the cecum, you can tilt the table slightly Trendelenburg and roll the patient to their right so the barium moves to the ascending colon and air fills the cecum. Take at least two spot images of the air-filled cecum, preferably in a supine and oblique position. If the barium hasn't reached the appendix or terminal ilium, a compression paddle may be used to push barium into this area. A compression paddle may also be used to separate loops of bowel. 
Overhead images are taken by the technologist after the fluoroscopic portion of the study is completed. These overheads help piece together the spot images and provide the overall big picture of the examination with minimized magnification. Double contrast barium enema overhead protocols will vary by facility. A few of these overheads can't be replicated during the fluoroscopic exam, such as the left and right lateral decubitus images and the prone 30 degree caudal angle projection of the rectosigmoid junction. A radiologist should be ready to view these images before the patient is allowed to evacuate the barium in case further fluoroscopy or overheads are needed. The ideal study should demonstrate each segment of the colon in double contrast in at least two different positions. A post-evacuation x-ray may be obtained to demonstrate delayed barium filling of tracts in patients suspected of having diverticulitis or fistula, or sometimes in patients whose appendix or terminal ileum did not fill with barium. The patient should be instructed to drink large amounts of fluid after the examination, and they are able to resume their normal diet. I also tell the patients that it is normal to see white or gray in their stool. After reviewing the exam and images with a radiologist, dictate the report of the examination and findings. If there are critical or unexpected findings that need immediate attention, the referring physician should be contacted and that communication noted in the report. Thank you for watching this general overview of a double contrast barium enema examination.